Hey, welcome back to the food forest. So work ended like five minutes ago. I work from home two days a week. Today's one of those days and it's nice when I don't spend my time in the car driving home. I can actually just get right outside into the food forest and show you guys what's going on. Tons of feedback over the winter time that you want tons and tons of updates and just walking around pointing my camera at plants in the food forest and you want them often regular. So here I am. I'm gonna go and show you, I don't know, what's new in the food forest today. It changes every single day. Okay, well first off, while I'm here, I might as well show you the apple tree as there's also bees all in here. You see them all? Sometimes it's hard. I can't really tell if you can see them all. But I can hear them all around me. And I might as well show an update of the graphs. So we did the graphs a few weeks ago. And we've got a little bit of swelling of the buds. Let's check out some of the other ones. I'm just going to show you how it's going. Even if they're dead, I'm just going to show you. So we've got a little bit of green growth on this one here. Now, keep in mind always, when you're doing your own graphs, that just because you see whether or not a graft is taken doesn't really mean anything. You know, these buds are swelling here at the end. Looks good so far. Another one here. So, so far so good, but remember that your grafts are actually gonna bud based off of the water that's in the wood and whether or not they survive or not is really going to be a more of a long-term thing. Whether or not these actually are still alive in about two months. You know, that's going to be the real test. So here's the food forest. You can see the peaches are fairly slow to leaf out. And they're immediately leafing out with some peach leaf curl. So we pull these off. And it's good to stay on top of this. It's good to try to not bounce the plant around as much as you can so we try to stay on top of this because it spreads really easily and it's actually going to rain tonight it rained yesterday so we pulled them all off any affected leaves so some people will spray a copper solution uh, you can do that if you want I try to avoid spraying anything on my fruit trees if I don't have to even not just for the fact that maybe it's a a toxic chemical you know copper is fine um, I just don't want to participate in that kind of um, supply chain kind of footprint as well if I don't have to and then of course the you know just the monetary if I don't have to and I found that I can actually maintain this pretty good by just picking off the affected leaves I'll have to come back um, make sure I got them all. It's always hard to do while I'm recording, kind of one-handed here. So I'll come back in and just double check and grab them all later. But uh, this one here is a Reliance Peach. And, and this one does get the leaf curl, but not super bad. I find my veteran peach is by far the worst. Peach leaf curl won't kill your peach, um, but what it does is I'm removing all of these leaves so that all the leaves don't get affected because what will end up happening is these leaves will curl up really, really tiny and shrivel up and fall off. And what I'm doing is trying to, by removing the effective leaves, I'm trying to prevent um, all of the leaves from being lost on my tree or else this thing will literally wipe out every single leaf on the tree And then you'll have to reset And then that's just stressful for the tree because it has to regrow all those leaves without any photosynthesis energy And that's just really hard on the tree So we'll leave it at that for now. I won't do a whole video on peach leaf curl We'll get out and show you what other stuff's going on um, and I'll go back and fix that later on. Yeah, so this is a black currant here. So you can see we're going to get lots of fruit this year. This whole thing is just loaded up. I have to say, of all of the 
bushes that I have, currants are probably, you know, rock solid, one of the most dependable. I don't know if I can film that ladybug without getting my camera shadow. You can see that we've got some pest security force hanging out on the currents, which is always nice to see. Here's uh, another service berry tree, and it is going to be loaded up. Now we get these tiny little flies that will get inside of the service berries on some years. And you can sometimes see their eggs underneath the leaves of the tree. And this is why it's really good to have an integrated pest management system where you are surrounding your trees with herbs so that you try to attract predators into these flowering herbs that are all up and growing up right inside your tree. So you get predators hanging out just like that ladybug was on the leaves and then they are immediately, as soon as the eggs hatch for the predator, or for the pest, sorry, then the predator is right there eating them. So this is what we try to do around all of our trees. You'll notice we usually have things growing right up inside the canopy of all of our trees. You know, wherever we can, I leave, for example, the rhubarb flower up common wisdom is to cut that off so that you get more energy going into the rhubarb which is nice I'll get a little rhubarb snack while we go um, but what you lose then is you lose all the insects that are in on the rhubarb flowers that are sitting right next to the service berry leaves and this way you lose that predator pest relationship so anytime that I can, I try to leave flowering uh, plants right in and around, ideally right growing up into the canopy of my trees. You can see here, same thing, we've got a rhubarb at the drip edge of that pear, and the rhubarb is attracting different insect predators that then will eat the coddling moss on the pear. And you can see we've also expanded the herbaceous layer on the bottom of the pear. We will want more insect pollinator attractors, so we put some goldenrod in there. And then hopefully that goldenrod gets up, and right when the pears actually blossom out, then we'll actually get the same thing happening. Predators growing right inside the canopy of our actual fruit. So, we show everything on this channel. Got some tent caterpillars here, growing right in the peach tree and if they want to snack on some peach leaf curl leaves they can go ahead so these are going to be food for birds and I leave this kind of stuff up I won't take it down I'll take the odd one down but I always leave some and it's because I want there to be food for the predators if I take all of this away then I've got no food for the predators so then what are the predators gonna eat they're gonna not even come here but if I'm a predator and I like to eat this, then I will love my land and I'll naturalize and put my eggs in my soil so that next time, next season, when this uh, insect pops up, then uh, they will already have uh, predators established. You can see this area here, which is kind of the strawberry patch. We've got has caps and currants and asparagus growing in here. You can see that I'm, I'm really trying to close in and have green stuff growing everywhere. So I try to focus on natives anywhere I can. If something volunteers, I look what it is. If it's something I don't mind growing here, I let it grow. I let nature kind of plant things for me. And the tighter and denser we can actually grow our food like this, the less pressures that we actually have. So I showed you tent caterpillars, but we used to have really bad coddling moths, and we used to use, lose all of our apples to coddling moth, and we don't lose any anymore. I haven't seen a coddling moth in my apples in probably a couple years now. So this is how we design our guilds here. You can see it's pretty dense, it's pretty packed, this swale berm here. And we try to get tons and tons of plants growing all together. 
So here we've got our linden tree as the overstory in this guild. This is right at the entrance to my land, kind of the, one of the corners of my land. So I want to have a pollinator attractor. This is a great bee tree and brings in pollinators. I want that right at the edge of my land so that they can kind of come in. They see the thing that they like, they smell it, and then they look and they say, holy smokes, I've got lots here to eat. And then they naturalize. So that's the goal. We want to get things naturalizing on our food forest in our land. So you can see same thing here, just ground cover. We've got a lot of goldenrod that wants to show up. Some people call it a weed here, but it's a fantastic plant. We've got a maple tree coming up that's going to kind of be a companion plant to this linden. But it's young, so it'll be a while before this thing takes over and gets up above. And one day, it'll be this nice little walking path underneath this maple. Kind of like that maple. And I do want to have some maples when I'm uh, retired, because I think I'd like to... Uh, to make maple syrup tap my trees so these ones here sorry for spinning the camera so much these ones here may or may not still be around but i want to make sure that i've got succession ones coming in even for the grandkids one day if they want to keep this land and do what grandpa did and live inside of a food forest and they will be able to we've got this blackberry which actually behaves itself really well here man when i went to british columbia I sure did notice that the blackberries were out of control there. They really don't uh, cause that much problem here, where I am. They kind of behave themselves. So we're just going to walk down to the Old Man Walking Trail area. This is an area of my land that I hadn't really developed until, I don't know, a couple years ago. And um, I let it go really wild. I don't really mow the grass that often here. I want there to be bee food. And I just have to be careful because it ticks, so I have to check myself whenever I come down here. We're turning this into a bit of a wild garden now. You can see that we sowed in a whole bunch of bushes and trees that are now starting to come up and push up through the weedy mess. We're going to kind of turn this into a little glade. And then on this side here, we've got the old man walking trail. And excuse the long grass. And I think this winter we had a lot of wind and it blew a lot of the leaves away. So you can actually see we're really low on mulch here. So I'm going to have to get in here and add a little bit. But we've added a lot of cherries and currants and has caps. Uh, this was a willow that I dug up. Um, that doesn't look like it's doing very well. I think it's probably dead. I haven't checked on that in about six, eight months or so. And then this grass is up to my knees so this definitely could probably use a cut but down here we've got the pawpaws and the pawpaws are flowering which is so nice to see when I just stepped on something wet what was that that was a slug yuck okay well so yeah, we've got a lot of flowers on the pawpaw here, which is really, really exciting. And pawpaws need to get pollinated by a genetically diverse uh, pawpaw tree. So you need to have at least two, and they can't be cloned. So they can't be uh, done by uh, graft from the same scion wood of a tree. So this one here, and I believe this one here are identical clones. We added one there, which is hiding behind the comfrey which I will actually help get a little bit more light. So we'll kind of cut this down a bit. Got some chives in here to help protect against maybe rabbits or something. I thought it's a good idea. You know what, this is getting pretty good sun. So we'll just take a little bit and we'll throw that mulch down. And this one here hasn't flowered, um, but it is doing okay. Not doing fantastic, but it's doing okay. This one here got caught by when this uh, ash tree fell, it literally fell right on top, like it homing missiled right on top of this and took it right out. This was two years ago. So we actually um, 
kind of pruned off the dead part and look at this it's already growing and the exciting thing here is that we've got flowers on this one and I'm pretty sure this one is genetically diverse from the other one because they're from completely different nurseries about four hours apart so they should be pretty good so we should get pollination if I don't get pollination this year I might try to manually pollinate but I really want to make sure that that's something I have to do before I go and commit to doing it. So the rest of the old man walking trail goes underneath these wild apple trees. You can see we've got some tent caterpillars up there as well, which again, we leave. This is one part of the food forest that I really enjoy because it's much more mature. And I've added to it all these um, all this edible uh, there's a little bit of colt's foot in there which is a medicinal it looks like creeping charlie has decided that it wants to dominate the ground space which is unfortunate but um, i don't get out here and i can't possibly come out here enough to manage that so we'll just allow that to happen i always love it when i get volunteers like this great leaf mullen coming in can remove these leaves and use them for tea so i might do that uh, later, I do get the invasive dog strangling vine everywhere, always. It can mulch with it. It won't reroot from the cuttings. We got raspberries down in here. You can see I kind of put together a guild around this wild apple tree, just in this totally wild area. And I left this branch because I thought it'd be neat to walk over. But over the years, it's gotten heavier with the fruit and it's come lower and lower each year. So I can just barely make under it now, which is still actually kind of nice. I've showed this before, sumac tree that fell. And you can tell that I'm just so busy. I don't have time to get to this. It's low priority right now. But last year we put in a whole bunch of um, like wild cherries in here. Uh, we've got some cranberries that we put in. So just trying to add things into this wilder area that can one day become the dominant canopy and get up and over some of these wilder plantings. Just jump over these. And then we come into the back side of Wildflower Hill. We've got, uh, look at this mullein. Isn't this fantastic? Just wonderful. I love seeing this because now I know, with honestly, with those two plants, I've got all the mullein tea that I need for the whole entire next year. And those are just volunteers. Oh, and look, another one there. So it's funny, the more you learn about plants, all of a sudden you see this weed that you used to think was a big, ugly weed, and now you see bounty. You see uh, food. Tea. so it's fantastic I really like that some of the prunings that I take I mesh into like a little habitat there so this can be habitat for uh, rabbits for birds even I think possibly for some foxes they might live in there and I think it's really good to have those if you have the land to have those little areas where you put little micro habitats in there there's no uh, coincidence that I put that right next to Wildflower Hill. So you can see no flowers yet, but tons of growth. Lots of fantastic stuff growing. And one nice thing about Wildflower Hill is that there's no poison ivy. So I do keep my eye out because I do have poison ivy kind of all on the outsides here. All on the outsides here, I got poison ivy. So I was putting those plywood down to try to keep it from coming into Wildflower Hill. No, that's not poison ivy. So, so far so good. The dogs do go walking right through it. Jenna. So sometimes we get it on our hands. But I guess that's just... That's just what it is when you live a little bit wilder and you let a little of this stuff come in and grow. So the pond's looking fantastic. 
Absolutely love how this is filling out and flushing out. You can see that I really spread that rutabecchia all down this hill and the um, oregano as well. And it is just everywhere. So I kind of did my little channel, my butters from South Park, uh, sowing a little bit of chaos into the world and put that stuff everywhere and it is coming up everywhere which I'm okay with. I would rather have a walking path that I have to slice my way through, but that actually has some functionality to it, than just have some blank walking path that wants to constantly grow weeds. I know this seems funny because I'm kind of growing weeds, you know, in my walking path deliberately, but I can just walk on these and the ones that I don't will flower and will actually give food for me. So there's some strawberries kind of coming out in this little cluster. These are the sea buckthorn that have just taken off in this dead, destroyed soil around the pond. I have a video called um, This Soil Sucks or something like that. And it was about when we dug out this pond, the quality of the soil was just absolutely atrocious. Backfill from the house, it was literally just gravel and stone and sand it was absolutely terrible dead soil so I figured you know what we're gonna plant a higher proportion of pioneers in this area which is why we added all the um, sea buckthorn everywhere understanding full well that the sea buckthorn is gonna really kind of take off and feel weedy and that's okay it's okay if it feels weedy it's doing its job it's a scab on a wound and it's gonna heal the soil and then over time, these other service berries will get up over top of the sea buckthorn. We'll start to shade them out. I can cut and harvest these for, um, for biochar, biomass, feedstock. And then they are also providing me a food source. So we've got a food yield. We've got an insect yield. We've got a soil builder. It's going to feel a little weedy at first for a couple years while it takes over and spreads. We'll just kind of actively manage it, but I actually do want that. And I actually celebrate it, and that is fine. So these Coreopsis are uh, starting to flower, which is kind of nice to see. This is my wife's favorite one. I forget what this thing's called. It's just an ornamental that she likes. This big kind of, she calls it the alien hairy looking thing. So that's kind of funny. That's doing well. So we do add a little bit of... Um, ornamental plants in and around the food forest but then we also added in things that are ornamental but also very functional like yarrow like uh, shasta daisies uh, even hostas hostas in the shady spot of this apple tree are a great companion for the apples great companion for the ostrich ferns and the hascaps and then i can eat the young shoots in the summertime or in the spring and they look nice and green and fantastic. And people see hostas and they're like, oh, I know that plant, that's not a weed. So that in and around the pond, you know, I get the social acceptance of these are good plants, even though I have some bad plants. But then it gives me the opportunity to, you know, educate people or maybe open their mind that this weedy looking thing, you know, it looks like a weed, but it turns into a beautiful daisy and it's, uh, it's great uh, attracting for pollinators and butterflies. So that is our little mini walk around. We just did the back side. Didn't get into the back backyard with the chickens. We'll maybe do that another time. I think this one's long enough. So what a fantastic way to unwind after a long, stressful day at work. If you have any room in your backyard, consider planting and giving a little bit of it back to nature. Grow a little bit of food for yourself, but grow a little bit of paradise on your land. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.